In August of 1990, Iraq invaded the nation of Kuwait and took it over. U.S. President George H.W. Bush made a policy decision that this would not stand, and he formed a coalition of more than 30 nations to participate in forcing Iraq back to its own borders. In October, 2nd Chemical Battalion joined the 18th Airborne Corps in defense of Saudi Arabia because nobody knew if Iraq would go farther. This phase of the operation was known as Desert Shield. Red Dragon spent weeks and sometimes months living in the desert, often sleeping in vehicles. The coalition assembled more than 900,000 troops. They were positioned along the border with Saudi Arabia and Iraq, far out into the desert. After five weeks of airstrikes, the ground war began on February 24, 1991. War with Iraq was not to be taken lightly. Iraq had the fourth largest army in the world, equipped with modern aircraft and armor, largely purchased from Russia. Iraq had just finished an eight-year desert war with Iran, so their troops were hardened and seasoned. They had chemical weapons and were willing to use them. The Wall Street Journal carried a story that the Department of Defense had ordered 50,000 body bags. The coalition strategy was to make a wide sweep, cutting off the uh, Iraqi army, damaging its supply lines, and destroying all of its armor. The main striking force was Seventh Corps. That was the largest corps formation in history. Uh, numbering five divisions and an armored cavalry regiment. The 2nd Chemical Battalion provided all the chemical support for the entire 7th Corps, chemical recon, decon, and smoke generation. The 46th Chemical Company, equipped with M1059 smoke generator tracks, participated in the race across the desert. An M1059 is outside 2nd Chemical Headquarters at Fort Hood. The first step was to blow the berm that Iraq had erected to defend its borders. Once through the berm, 2nd Chemical was initially attached to the 1st Infantry Division, which had the main attack responsibility. When main attack shifted to 3rd Armored Division, so did 2nd Chemical. The situation was two divisions were racing along, 20,000 soldiers each, both in contact with the enemy. The Red Dragons had to leave one division, travel about 70 miles through a trackless desert at night, and fit into the 3rd Armored Division formation. They didn't have GPS, only maps and compasses. The race across the desert destroying all Iraqi forces became known as the Hundred Hour War. The Red Dragon's path was thick with destroyed Iraqi tanks and littered with unexploded bomblets from American MLRS systems. Reaching Kuwait, the Red Dragons found the skies dark with smoke from burning oil wells that the Iraqis had ignited. Subsequent to the Hundred Hours, the Red Dragons guarded prisoners, but mostly they ended the war just as they had begun it, waiting in the desert. Eventually they returned to Saudi Arabia along the Highway of Death, also known as Damnation Alley. Along this road, American Air had left thousands of burned out vehicles of all types littering the desert. Now let's hear the personal experiences of three Red Dragons who actually made the race across the desert in the Hundred Hour War. I am Staff Sergeant Jason Rucker of the 172nd Seaburn Company. I will be playing the role of Specialist Derek Raymar of the 46th Chemical Company. 
Specialist Derek Raymar was a normal guy who had several jobs that didn't quite pan out for him. Uh, because of his military background and family, the next logical route for him was to join the military where he joined the chemical, uh, chemical corps. The reason he joined the chemical corps was because of a chemical National Guard unit that was stationed near where he lived. Once he was in the chemical corps and the 46th chemical company, Specialist Derek Raymar deployed to Iraq in support of Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield. Hi, I'm Corporal Lindsay Hayden. I'll be playing the role of Sergeant First Class John Brackwitz. Sergeant First Class John Brackwitz joined the military and the aviation and later transitioned to the Chemical Corps. Hello, I'm Private Austin Hicks and I'll be playing the part of Major Mike Brown. Major Mike Brown started off as a pre-med student who just didn't get through selection and instead he decided to join the Chemical Corps. Hey sir, I saw it. How's everything been going? And going pretty well, pretty well. Yeah, it's going great over here, no complaints. Hmm. Well, sir, I heard you, uh, I heard you got promoted to colonel and retired. Oh yeah, getting that retirement pay, I'm loving it. What about you, Sarah? How's things been going lately? They've been going great. I have no, honestly, no complaints. Just living day to day. And, yeah. Maybe think a little bit, talk, talking about our ranks and stuff like that and how we retired and finished. How did we actually get into the chemical corps? How did you get in, sir? Uh, I actually got in uh, after I got through pre-med uh, and did, did get selected for medical and decided, you know, I'll join the Army for a little bit and see where it goes from there. And uh, Never went back to medical ever again. Yeah, I was getting married, decided I needed a job, steady pay. I joined the Army. At first I was in aviation, and I decided to take a different route and went to the chemical corps. Well, it was a little bit different. I had a lot of jobs that didn't pay out so well, so my next logical step was to join the military. I had a bunch of military family and stuff like that, so I decided to join and joined the Chemical Corps because of the National Guard unit that was stationed close to where I was. So all I knew was chemical, so that's what I did. So how was it getting into theater? For me, I was riding on the back of a C-141, sitting on pipes being held together with cargo nets next to a cut V and a blazer. And we were getting ready to land, and all of a sudden the pilots start getting in their mop gear and they didn't tell us to don ours, so we're sitting there thinking, what do they know that we don't know? What are they not telling us? So we asked, why are you getting a map here? Should we put ours on? And at that time, they told us, well, you never know when you're gonna get attacked. You don't know where the enemy's coming from, you don't know what to expect, so you always need to be ready. So we put on our map here and we waited to land. How about you, sir? Do you remember your first moments? I do indeed, I remember all these armored vehicles going through the border berm into Iraq and I just thought to myself, I'll never see anything so miraculous ever again. What about some of the things that we saw during Desert Storm and Desert Shield? You guys ever think about that stuff? I do, quite often. Yeah, it weighs heavily on my mind. What's the craziest thing that you, that you remember? Well, the craziest thing I remember is uh, when one of the one of my soldiers decided to uh, try to take a bomblet home with him and threw it in the back of the truck and blew it, blew it up completely. Yeah, you know, the craziest thing I remember is like we were driving and there was bodies everywhere from being shot and there was one body in particular that just stays in my mind and it had one guy's body on one side of the road standing straight up in the sand and his legs on the other side of the road standing straight up in the sand. That image stays with me every day. Yeah, it's gotta be haunting. Somebody's body standing in the sand. I didn't see anybody's body, anybody's body standing in the sand. But we used to drive across these fields, the oil fields, and the sand just blew over so many bodies. As we were passing down the road, we just see them on the sides. And then some of them were so swollen from the sun and stuff like that. And then the sand was covering some so you couldn't see them. And in the tank, if we hit them, they would explode. Ooh. Horrifying. Wow. Actually horrifying. 
What about you, sir? Anything, kind of, anything kind of like that? Nothing, nothing too morbid, really. Um, honestly, just basically bombs and you know moving through the night. At one point, we had a National Guard unit stationed with us, and they kind of they were they weren't following the main like caravan. They were kind of going towards the British tanks because they had brighter taillights. I stopped him and I was redirecting him multiple times. I was like, hey, stay with us, we're going this way. It turns out none of them had NDGs and uh, we just kind of slowed down after that and tried to keep them with us. Dang. Speaking of NDGs, we had them. They just didn't work because there was no ambient light. It was so dark at night. We couldn't see anything. There was one time I was trying to go to the latrine in the middle of the night and I walked past it and ended up at the latrines four companies down and didn't realize it until I walked into the wrong company and these people are staring at me like, who the heck are you? I didn't walk past anything, but we drove past a lot. And all feels the smoke, even though it was sunlight outside, it still looked like night. Most of my driving was at night anyway because of our maneuvers that we were performing. And we were just in smoke during the, during the daytime, so it felt like night. And we just drive for days and days at a time. One of the times we had a vehicle that broke down while we were crossing a burn. And we ended up having to hook up to him. We radioed up and let everybody know that we had it under control, so it wasn't a major issue. And we drove through the smoke for a day and a half, not knowing where we were going. Wow, wow. Uh, I didn't really had too much like that happen to me, but at one point uh, we were driving down the road and we just suddenly stopped. Right? There was this gridlock, this complete halt. And then I figured out that it was because a bunch of uh, artillery pieces were moving across the road and uh, I had just seen the movie Patton and I was like, all right, it's time to pull a Patton. So I told my driver to pull up to the intersection and I got up on top of my Humvee and I started directing traffic and then in like an hour or so, we were moving smoothly again. We didn't have any directing traffic, but what we had was nobody knew who was friend from foe, so we had to paint our vehicles with an upside down V on it so that we knew that they were friendly and to avoid a blue incident, blue on blue incident. And blue, so we had a blue on blue that it's not funny by any means because it's a serious issue during the time because of the awareness we had. But we did have one incident later down the line that ended up being funny to us at the moment because of where we were and how we were. They gave us camel nets to camouflage ourselves in the desert and you would never ever take a guess. What color did they give us for our camel nets? Probably army green. Army green in the middle of the desert. What was I hiding from? Nothing. I was hiding from nothing, exactly. You know, I kind of relate to the Blue on Blue incident you were talking about, because we nearly had one of them ourselves. Uh, honestly, if I hadn't had that high-powered radio to you know, call up and say, hey, we're moving through your AO, we would have gotten blasted. So the radio has helped us out, too. So that's one thing Supply did do well. They gave us decent communications equipment because of the, the vehicle we had to tow through the fields. Only reason we were able to do that and not have any issues was because of our radio. But outside of that, the supply just kind of fell off. It was a big, big issue while we were there. Yeah, we also had an issue getting supply. Uh, we, at one point, ended up finding a fuel yard that was left unsupervised, and we stole 1,200 gallons of GP8 diesel fuel, and then we were driving away and we seen another unit that, and they asked us, do you have any fuel? And we just said no, we felt bad, but we needed to make sure that we were good. We were one of the only companies that made it through without ever running out of gas the whole time we were there. Yeah, gas wasn't really a major issue for us because of, because of the tanks. We just kind of mowed over everything and didn't have to really worry, but one of the craziest things that happened as far as supplying yourself, we had a, a, a platoon of Iraqi tankers that had surrendered to us. And at the time, we didn't know that they were tankers. We just saw off in the horizon 
that people were walking toward us with white flags, and we knew they were surrendering. So all of our all of our uh, weapon systems trained on them. And then we approached them, found out that they were indeed surrendering. We detained them and then handed them off to the uh, military police to have. And upon further investigation, once we went to check the area that they came from and stuff, we found out that they had a six a six uh, six tank element that would have easily wiped us out. So I felt like we got really lucky and survived that. And we ended up raiding their stash of uh, stuff that we found. We found their bunker located near it. We ended up taking coolers, uh, chairs, carpets, and all the stuff like that, which helped us out because of uh, supplying ourselves because resupply didn't come, especially because we were quarantined from being inside of their bunker. So we slept in our tents and set up their carpets and chairs and stuff like that. And just kind of hung out for a week until it was time and then we moved on again. Y'all dealt with that too? Uh, funny story on luck actually. Uh, one morning I uh, woke up to a tank turret pointed at my tent and I thought to myself, what the, what is going on here? But it turns out a bunch of infantry dudes had come in and uh, kind of captured these tankers that had tanks pointed at our position and kind of just like you, we uh, managed to get a tank key, we got inside the turrets, we found fuel and ammunition for days and that's how we helped to sustain ourselves. Yeah. It, it was really, there was a lot of luck involved in some of the situations, but thank God for tactics, because it would have been rough. Anything like that, Sarah? No, we had, um, not necessarily like that, a, a lot of our time was spent driving, and then when we weren't driving, we just had some downtime where we hung around, we made up games to play to keep ourselves entertained. Uh, one of the guys in our unit had, his uncle owned a tobacco company and ended up shipping out cases of cases of chewing tobacco. So everyone just started chewing tobacco, even the smokers. We just kind of hung around. There was a store that had phones and everything, so we could go get phones and go call our wives and yeah, driving and then waiting to drive again. So we did. Hmm. As a part of S3, I really didn't have all that much downtime, you know, um, constantly focusing on getting my soldiers supplies, making sure we were all set on fuel and everything else. So, in fact, at one point, I, we both probably remember quite well, but we did not have very much, very many supplies. So I actually had to go to Chief of Staff for First Infantry and talk to him. He gave me a piece of paper saying, take care of these soldiers printed that stuff off, copied it, and gave it to all the company commanders, and after that we never had a supply issue again. I think you're probably, if not responsible, very instrumental in the, one of the greatest moments that happened when we did get resupplied, because a uh, nearby mass unit actually helped us out quite a bit right during the time of, of, uh, of us being quarantined they ended up coming by, it was a colonel and a bunch of lieutenants, and they gave us a bunch of supplies. They gave us tea, lemon juice, limes, um, ice, and stuff like that that were essential as far as, you know, keep surviving. And that helped a lot because, one, we were constantly on, on, on mission. We didn't have much downtime. It was constant, constant mission, it seemed like, all the way up until the time we were getting ready to go. So. Thanks for helping out with supplies, sir. That is it's pretty big. No problem, no problem. There was a lot of really good times, a lot of bad times, but the best time was getting to go home. Yeah, my platoon was super excited to go home. Um, we remember them telling us that the war had just ended and we were so thankful, looking forward to it, but at the same time, crossing that berm from the known to the unknown weighed heavy on us. And the moment we got across the berm, we were driving on the highway that we used and they named it Damnation Alley is the nickname that was given to this highway. Because for miles and miles and miles, all you seen was tarnished from the war. Vehicles being blown up, tanks, bodies, just all over and you realize just how lucky you were to make it out. 
those were very long days. We had no supplies, we couldn't heat our MREs, we had to put our food up at the top. Uh, yeah, to break up the monotony, one of the sergeants decided to fire off a few rounds, which didn't make it very popular, but it, it broke the monotony and kind of brought a good vibe to the mission. And yeah, when we got to the docks, we were getting ready to ship up our gears and we had to clean. Oh my goodness, getting those, all those vehicles clean and everything, you thought you did such a good job, and then they would find a speck of dirt. And it was just, ugh. And then the flight home wasn't much better. I thought the flight there was uncomfortable. The flight home wasn't much better. Yes, we flew commercial, but we were so packed in there with our weapons and everything like that. We were packed like sardines the whole flight home, but man, getting home was so, so rewarding. We had, uh, we had an easier time getting out of there. Um, our tanks went to the docks and we had hands over there loaded and we didn't have to really do very much by way of that part. And we were getting flown out also. And we had one guy, a funny story, funny, one guy, Private Riviera, uh, amnesty time at the end of all everything, because we didn't get to keep any war trophies or anything like that. They told us we had to turn everything in. He had an AK and a handgun that he literally refused to give up. He would not do it. So after convincing and convincing and a little convincing, he finally gave it up. And once we got home, we heard him complain for days and days and days and just really angry with all of us because nobody ever even checked. He could have kept it all. Speaking of war souvenirs, actually on the way home, we had found a case of enemy AK-47s with the bayonets attached and they gave a bayonet to each person in our platoon. I know I still have mine hanging in the garage. I look at it and just think. So I'd like to thank you both for being here today, sharing your experiences with me and uh, hoping to share the memories of our fallen battle buddies. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm Private Hicks and I'm a Red Dragon soldier because I'm ferocious, capable, determined, and I never give up.